Good morning, everyone. My name is Commissioner Cindy Jeffries, and I am the federal mediator who will be uh, part of a facilitation team from Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome all of you to the United States Department of Education's negotiated rulemaking through which the Institutional and Programmatic Eligibility Committee will prepare proposed regulations for the federal student aid programs authorized under Title VII of the Higher Education Act of 1965 as amended. In an effort to welcome everyone, the department, committee negotiators, advisors, and the public actively viewing and following our sessions, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Gregory Martin, the department's federal negotiator. Gregory? Thank you, Cindy. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, this morning, even if only virtually. And uh, I want to thank all of you for being willing to. I'm, I'm honored to be to be a part of it and representing the department. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Undersecretary James Qual, who has a few opening remarks. Mr. Qual. Thanks so much, Greg. Good morning, everybody. I am James Qual, the Undersecretary of Education. Uh, here at the department, I coordinate our work on post-secondary education, adult and career education, and federal student aid. On behalf of Secretary Miguel Cardona and the staff of the Department of Education, I wanted to welcome you to this round of negotiated rulemaking. President Biden and Secretary Cardona have laid out an ambitious vision for how we can rebuild our system of higher education around equity. And their work so far has led to an unprecedented investment in colleges during this time of national recovery, especially those committed to the mission of equity and student success. This administration is also committed to tackling issues of accountability and oversight. And I'm thrilled um, that we're beginning this work today. Many of you know that the department recently completed negotiated rulemaking on a set of issues related to affordability and student loans uh, in December. And we recognize that the student loan system has left many students worse off due to unaffordable debts and appreciate the help of stakeholders in restoring a student loan safety net so that borrowers have protections against unaffordable debts, opportunities for second chances and protections when everything in life goes wrong. We will continue that work by publishing proposed rules for further public comment later this year. The work of this panel is equally important. During these meetings, you will provide insights, expertise, and firsthand experiences into how the department can ensure its rules are promoting accountability for institutions and how we can ensure that institutions are offering high quality and how high value programs to students. Thank you for your time. This work is a priority for the administration and it's my hope that the regulations developed here will move us closer to clear policies that protect students and taxpayers. We have a full rulemaking agenda and I know everyone's eager to get to work. Uh, several of you know this is not the first time we have regulated on some of these topics and I appreciate the work that has occurred previously and now we have an opportunity to learn from that experience and build on what's come before. Because this is a virtual rulemaking, there may be some technology challenges. We don't anticipate major issues, but uh, please be patient if we do encounter technical difficulties from time to time. On the bright side, virtual hearings has expanded access to negotiators who might have uh, challenges traveling to DC uh, and a special welcome to those of you who are dialing in uh, very early on West Coast time. Uh, through live streaming and posting all recordings from the committee, we will also continue to ensure full transparency to the public. In closing, I wanna say thank you once again to members of the committee and those in advisory roles for your willing to advise us and to be so generous with your time. Uh, this is an important process and we couldn't do it without you. Secretary Cardona and I know that you take this work very seriously and we're very appreciative of your efforts. I also want to thank members of the post-secondary community who are watching and who will weigh in on these important issues. And of course, I want to thank Acting Assistant Secretary Michelle Asha Cooper, our negotiator Greg Martin, and the staff in the Office of Post-Secondary Education and across the department whose hard work has made these proceedings possible. Post-secondary education remains one of the best investments in equity and upward mobility, and we need to make sure that promise is kept for all students. I appreciate uh, your work to make sure we can achieve that goal. Thank you.
Thank you, Greg and Under Secretary Kowal. We appreciate your um, remarks and encouragement. So we will begin today with introductions and then together review the process, protocols, and agenda. So at this time, uh, we will introduce in this order the Department of Education participants, the primary and alternate negotiators of the committee, the experts selected to serve as advisors, and finally, your third party facilitators from FMCS, which includes myself and three of my esteemed colleagues. So as mentioned before, our federal media, uh, federal negotiator is Mr. Greg Martin. Um, Greg, is there anything you'd like to share with us by way of introduction to yourself? Uh, yeah, I have very lengthy remarks prepared. No, not at all. Um, <laughs> I just want to say that I, uh, again, I want to say how glad I am to be here. Some of you I know and have worked with in the past. So uh, for those of you uh, whom I've encountered at conferences or in other, other various ways, uh, it's good to see you all back. And for those who I'm meeting for the first time, uh, I'm excited about the prospect of working with all of you. Um, I, I just want to say that I know we come from, uh, everybody comes from um, different backgrounds and that people represent different positions. And, um, I, you know, these are negotiations, so there will be differences of opinion, and um, I expect that. Um, I just hope we can all, uh, when I do these things, I hope to maintain a makeability as best, uh, you know, to the highest degree uh, possible. And uh, to keep in mind that we're, you know, at the end of the day, we're all still friends. We're all, all of us trying to do the best we can to, uh, to help students. So um, just we keep that in mind uh, throughout the week, even when, you know, I know sometimes it's, it's hard, you know, when you're very passionate about something, but uh, just try to keep that in mind. And uh, I think we'll have a great, uh, a great three sessions uh, coming up uh, this month, February and in March. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. Um, we also have several non-voting participants from the department's Office of General Counsel that will be assisting throughout uh, this, this entire rulemaking. Those individuals are Mr. Steve Finley, Ms. Donna Mangold, Ms. Denise Morelli, Mr. Alejandro Reyes, and Mr. Ron San. So we welcome all of them to the process. There are uh, a couple additional department representatives who will wear a number of hats for us throughout these proceedings. Um, correspondence, information sharing, screen sharing, language tracking, and work with the committee. Um, and those uh, two individuals who will be primarily doing that are Ms. Vanessa Gomez, who will be uh, doing the screen sharing for us uh, today, and Mr. Aaron Washington. We welcome both of you. Um, so with that, we're going to move next to introduce the esteemed members of our Institutional and Programmatic Eligibility Committee. These negotiators have been nominated by the public and selected by the department to represent 13 respective constituencies. For each constituency, we will invite the primary negotiator and alternate negotiator to briefly introduce themselves on behalf of their constituency group. Um, so for the constituency accrediting agencies, we have Ms. Uh, Jameen S. Studley, Thank, thank you very much, Cindy. Yes, I'm Jamie and Studley. I'm president of WASC, the Western, um, the WASC Senior College and University Commission. Um, you can call us by our nickname, WASC, if you refer to us. Uh, yesterday marked my fourth four-year anniversary in the role of CEO of this organization. Uh, earlier, I have served as deputy and acting undersecretary of the U.S. Department of Education, um, acting. Uh, Deputy and Acting General Counsel and Chair of NISIKI, uh, all of which was a privilege and um, I'm honored to be working with the department again um, in this capacity. I've also served as president of Skidmore College, of a civil rights advocacy group called Public Advocates and Associate Dean of Yale Law School. Thank you, Thank appreciate you, it. You are so welcome. And as alternate for the group is Dr. Laurel Racer King. Good morning. My name is Laura Racer King. I am the executive director of the Council on Education Health, which is a specialized um, accrediting agency that accredits um, uh, public health degrees from the baccalaureate to the doctoral level. Um, this is my second uh, rulemaking, 
And um, Laura, your um, audio is um, coming in and out. So I'm not sure. It seemed like if you when you moved closer to your microphone, it was stronger. So just uh, uh, please uh, be aware of that. For the constituency civil rights organizations and consumer advocacy organizations, the primary is Ms. Carolyn Fass. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Carolyn Fast. I'm a senior fellow with the Century Foundation. Prior to that, I uh, was special counsel with the New York Attorney General's Office Consumer Frauds Bureau, where I worked in enforcement, um, specifically with a focus on higher education. Thank you, Carolyn. And the alternate is Mr. Jalen Herbin. Good morning, Jalen Herbin. I serve as a policy and outreach associate for Center for Responsible Lending. And prior to that, I serve as a district liaison for Congresswoman Alma Adams. Thanks, Jalen. For the constituency, federal aid administrators at post secondary institutions, our primary is Ms. Samantha Veter. Good morning, uh, my name is Sam Beter and I'm the Associate Dean of Enrollment and Director of Financial Aid at the University of Rochester. Uh, I am currently serving on the NASPA board and I am past president of the Eastern Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators and I've had several positions also in the New York State Financial Aid Administrators Association. Thank you, Sam. And the alternate is Mr. David Peterson. Morning, everyone. I'm Dave Peterson. I'm with the University of Cincinnati, where I serve as the Assistant Vice Provost for Enrollment Management. Uh, I've been in financial aid or enrollment management for 28 years and uh, really looking forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Um, for the constituency four year public institutions of higher education, the primary is Mr. Marvin Smith. Good morning, I'm Marvin Smith. I'm Executive Director of Financial Aid and Scholarships at UCLA. I have 30 years of experience as a, um, in financial aid. I've worked for the University of California, Los Angeles campus, uh, Purdue University, and Indiana University. So I'll be representing the four-year publics. Thank you, Marvin. And the alternate is Ms. Deborah Stanley. Good morning, my name is Deborah Stanley. Uh, Currently, the director of financial aid at Bowie State University in Bowie, Maryland. Um, I have 30 plus years in higher education, including at one point working with the Department of Education. I look forward to working with everyone. Thanks, Deborah. For the constituency legal aid organizations that represent students and or borrowers, the primary is Mr. Johnson Tyler. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, in the category of 30 years and more in one field. Uh, I've worked at a legal services office in Brooklyn um, and been specializing in student loans, I'd say for the last eight years. Thank you. Thank you, Johnson. And the alternate is Ms. Jessica Renucci. Good morning, my name is Jessica Renucci. I'm an attorney at the New York Legal Assistance Group. We're a legal services organization in New York City. Thank you, Jessica. For the constituency minority serving institutions, the primary is Dr. Beverly Hogan. Good morning, I'm Beverly Wade Hogan, and I served for 17 years as president of Tulu College and another five years as, as the vice president. And during that time, I had the pleasure of working with many organizations in higher education, including the National Association of Independent Colleges and Council of independent colleges, NAPIO, and UNCF serving on that board. And I'm currently doing some work with UNCF as a president and resident. And I'm looking forward to the work before us. Thank you, Dr. Hogan. For the uh, alternate is Ms. Ashley Schofield. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ashley Schofield. I am the Associate Vice President for Fiscal Affairs at Southland University in Lynchburg, South Carolina. I am representing the MSIs and HBCUs constituent group. I have been here at Claflin for nine years um, and I'm an EAB fellow along with serving on the Nakubo Higher Education Accounting Forum Committee. And I'm looking forward to work. 
Thank you, Ashley. Moving on for the constituency of non or of private nonprofit institutions of higher education. The primary is Ms. Kelly Perry. Good morning. My name is Kelly Perry. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Finance and Controller at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. I also serve as the um, Vice President of Nukubo's Accounting Principal Council, and this is my uh, second negotiation, and I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Kelly. And the alternate is Mr. Emmanuel A. Guillory. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Emmanuel Guillory. I work for the National Association of Independent Colleges and Universities, serving as their director of student and institutional aid policy. I'm about 13 years into my career, spent 10 of those as a staffer um, in Congress, most recently working for the House Committee on Education and then the workforce, and then working for UNCF for two years and now then with NICU. So happy to be here and good to see you. Thank you, Emmanuel. For the constituency proprietary institutions of higher education, the primary is Mr. Bradley Adams. Good morning. My name is Brad Adams and I serve as the Chief Operating Officer for South College. And prior to becoming the COO in 2018, I had the opportunity to serve as the Chief Financial Officer for the institution since 2014. Uh, South College is regionally accredited by SACS to award degrees ranging from certificate to doctorate. Uh, prior to South College, I worked at Tennessee Valley Authority for five years, a federally owned electric utility corporation. And I started my career with PricewaterhouseCoopers working in auditing for uh, for-profit and non-profit companies all over the world, including some institutions of higher learning. Look forward to speaking with everyone. Thank you, Brad. And the alternate is Mr. Michael Lanwet. I will note that when we get to the issue of um, ability to benefit um, the alternate Mr. Michael Lanawat will be sitting at the table in place of Mr. Adams. So Michael. Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Dr. Mike Lanawat. I have over 30 years of experience in the proprietary uh, post-secondary section as well as the nonprofit uh, section. Uh, I currently hold a position of Vice President of Administration for a series of colleges, Aviation Institute of Maintenance, Tidewater Tech, and Centura College. Thank you, Mike. For the constituency state attorneys general, the primary is Mr. Adam Well. Good morning. Uh, my name is Adam Welly. I'm an attorney at the Minnesota Attorney General's Office. I've been uh, at the AG's office for about seven years. I work in our consumer wage and antitrust division, which um, handles a number of matters around advocating for consumers, enforcing consumer protection laws, um, I work in the area, uh, among others, of um, student loans and higher education. So it's good, good to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And the alternate is Ms. Yael Shavit, who will be sitting at the table the entire week, uh, first week, uh, in place of Adam. Yael? Hi, my name is Yael Shavit. I'm the managing attorney in the Consumer Protection Division of the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office. I've been in the office for about six years and I'm one of the lead attorneys on much of our work related to higher education financing, for-profit consumer fraud and student loan servicing. Looking forward to working with everyone in the committee. Thanks, Jayu. For the constituency, state higher education executive officers, state authorizing agencies and or state regulators of institutions of higher education and or loan servicers, the primary is Ms. Debbie Cochran. Hi, thank you. Um, that's a mouthful of a category, um, and I am one of the state regulators of institutions of higher education. I am chief of California's Bureau for Private and Secondary Education, um, which approves over a thousand institutions in, to operate in the state of California. Um, the Bureau also houses the state's Office of Students Assistance and Relief, known as OSAR, which provides guidance and support to prospective, current, and future private post-secondary students. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. And the alternate is Mr. David Sokolow. Good morning. I'm David Sokolow. I'm the Executive Director of New Jersey's Higher Education Student Assistance Authority, um, which is the state's uh, financial aid uh, agency supporting uh, students attending post-secondary education in our state. Um, and thrilled to be part of this uh, negotiation. Um, I've been in this role for four years. Prior to that, I led um, uh, the Center for Post-Secondary and Economic Success at CLASP, 
um, and prior to that had a, a long career in both state and federal uh, government agencies. So looking forward to working with all of you. Thank you, David. For the constituency students and student loan borrowers, the primary is Mr. Ernest Izuego. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ernest Zugo. I am the Director of Policy and Advocacy for uh, Higher Education and Workforce at Young Invincibles, an organization dedicated to elevating the voice and power of young people in the political process. I'm also a student at the University of Maryland Global Campus, and I'm really excited and looking forward to working with you all over the next three months. Thank you, Ernest. And the alternate is Mr. Carney King. Good morning, my name is Carney King. Uh, I work in the California Senate currently, uh, representing students and student loan borrowers. Thank you, Carney. For the constituency to your public institutions of higher education, the primary is Dr. Ann Crest. Hi, I'm Ann Crest. I'm the president of Northern Virginia Community College. I have 30 years in the community college system and have worked in Florida and New York and now in Virginia. I'm excited to be here and thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kress. The alternate is Mr. William S. Durden. Thanks, Cindy. Good morning, everybody. Will Durden. I'm the Director of Basic Education for Adults with the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. That's uh, Title II WIO funds, for those of you who speak that language. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and uh, I'm really here representing adults who need both a secondary and a post-secondary credential. Thanks. Thank you, Will. For the constituency, U.S. military service members, veterans, or groups representing them, the primary is Mr. Travis Hoare. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Travis Hoare. I'm the Senior Director of Government Affairs at Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Uh, I've been at this organization for about Three and a half year focused uh, three and a half years focused on uh, education issues affecting service members and veterans. And prior to that, um, I was listed at the Marine Corps. I uh, went to college using the post 9-11 GI Bill. Um, and I'm honored to represent service members, veterans, and their families, as well as uh, a variety of veteran service organizations. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Travis. And the alternate is Mr. Barmak Nasirian. Good morning, everybody. My name is Barmak Nasirian. I am Vice President for Higher Ed Policy with, with Veterans Education Success, which is an organization committed to uh, improving educational outcomes for veterans, service members, and military connected families. Thank you, uh, Barmak. Appreciate it. That is all of the uh, uh, Negotiators, um, did I miss anyone? Okay, good start to a day. So I'd like to thank you all for introducing yourselves and for your time, efforts, expertise, and commitment to this process and the representation of your constituencies. We're glad to have this opportunity to work with each and every one of you through this process. To assist you with your work, we would like to take this opportunity to introduce two expert advisors who have been selected to serve as a resource to your committee. These individuals were similarly nominated by the public and chosen by the department. They are not themselves members of the committee and nor will they participate or impact consensus decision-making process. Instead, they are available to provide experience and research-based information and data to the committee, and perhaps make recommendations on regulatory language. First, I'd like to welcome and invite an introduction from our advisor as a compliance auditor with expertise auditing institutions that participate in Title IV HEA programs, Mr. David McClintock. Good morning, I'm Dave McClinic, the Managing Director for McClinic & Associates. We're a public accounting firm dedicated to providing consulting services to help post-secondary schools understand and comply with Title IV regulations so that they can focus on changing their students' lives. Each year, we issue well over 100 audit reports for post-secondary schools, including single audits, financial statement audits, and Title IV compliance audits. I'm honored to have been selected as a first auditor serve as an advisor in the negotiated rulemaking process, and I promise to utilize my experience to develop 
over the last 18 years auditing post-secondary schools to support these crucial conversations in any way that I can. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you, Dave, appreciate it. Um, next, I'd like to welcome and invite an introduction from our advisor for labor, econo and labor economists or an individual with expertise in research policy, accountability, and or analysts of higher education data, Dr. Adam Looney. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Adam Looney. I'm a, an economist and a professor of finance at the University of Utah. Uh, previously, I'd worked in DC for most of my career uh, at the Brookings Institution, at the Federal Reserve Board, uh, at the White House, and at the Department of Treasury. Uh, and much of that work was analyzing uh, federal programs from the inside, uh, for example, analyzing data on the outcomes of students for projects like uh, the college scorecard. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Appreciate it. Thank you, both advisors. Lastly, I would like to take a moment and introduce you to all your facilitation group. I and three of my colleagues who will introduce themselves momentarily are commissioners or federal mediators with the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service. FMCS is a small independent federal agency of the executive branch. We have several statutory bodies of work, one being negotiated rulemaking, specifically the Administrative Dispute Resolution Act of 1990 and the Negotiated Rulemaking Act of 1990 authorized FMCS to use its dispute resolution expertise to bring together the regulators and those impacted by their regulations in a collaborative process prior to the issuance of the rule. In this regulatory process, your FMCS team as a neutral third party will host the technology and platforms for your virtual sessions, we will facilitate the discussions and consensus for each issue. We will assist the negotiating committee in identifying and overcoming barriers that arise in multi-party negotiations. We will oversee the discussion and consensus for each issue and enforce the organizational protocols. We will work with the committee as appropriate in breakout and caucus spaces during sessions and with work groups between sessions. We will solicit and distribute documents and information for the Department of Education, committee and advisors and capture our process and progress in the drafting of a session summary. We are here to assist you every step uh, of the way. While you are the subject matter experts and focused on the topics before the committee, we will drive the process and move the committee through each session, navigating order, agenda, timeliness, strategies, and dynamics at the table, all in an effort to assist you to be solution-oriented and to build consensus. We want each of you to feel encouraged and empowered to reach out to us directly with questions, comments, concerns throughout this entire process. So for myself, I have been a mediator with FMCS for the past 11 and a half years, currently working out of Orlando, Florida, and I previously worked out of Albany, New York. I enjoy multi-party high-stake negotiations and always appreciate getting to work with subject matter experts in a variety of sectors, industries, locations, and circumstances. I am joined by three fellow FMCS colleagues who I'd like to invite to introduce themselves and anything I might not have mentioned about FMCS in our role. So first we have Commissioner Brady Roberts. Good morning everyone, Brady Roberts here with FMCS. Uh, nothing to add other than looking forward to working with everyone. Good morning. Thanks Brady. Next we have Commissioner Rosman Miller. She may have stepped away for a moment. Um, let's move to Commissioner Kevin Wagner. Hello, I'm Kevin Wagner, um, out of the headquarters uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, look forward to working with everyone uh, over the next uh, few months. Okay, and Roz just sent me a message. She is back. So, Roz, you want to introduce yourself? I think you might still be double muted, Roz. Sorry about that. I was double <laughs> muted. 
My name is Rosman Miller. I've been with the agency for 15 years, I'm specializing in all things conflict management, and I'm excited to be here today. Thanks, Ross. So I believe that we now have made all the introductions, and if I've missed someone, I apologize, and I invite you to let me know at this time. All right. So now that we've been through all the introductions, we'd like to remind you all to ensure that your naming convention is consistent with what has been requested. A quick scan looks like it is, but just for the public, it is the, the first name or the name that the party wants to be addressed by. A P stands for primary, a, a for alternate, and an abbreviated reference to your constituency group. In addition to the naming convention, I have a couple additional technology notes at this juncture. While you are not speaking, please keep your audio muted. This will help us all cut down on background noise, distractions, and be able to identify the speaker more readily at any given time. If you are at the main virtual table and have something to share, please raise your virtual hand by clicking the reactions icon at the bottom of your screen and selecting raise hand. We will generally call on folks throughout the process in the order in which their virtual hands appear on our screen. Should you have technology related questions today during our session, we, uh, we will identify each day of the session in the chat, the name and email address of one of us that will be filling that role on that day. Uh, for today, we have Brady Roberts, and I believe, Brady, you already put your information in the chat. So if you have technology issues, please reach out to, to Brady today. Um, a note on the chat feature, it will remain enabled during our sessions together. Please know that all messages sent out to the full group may be subject to an ongoing transcript. Direct messages outside of those sent to the department will not be subject to that same transcript. Each day, the public will have an opportunity to log in and observe our session via the live streaming. The department has posted a registration link for that on their website. Brady will also place that link uh, in the uh, chat right now. Um, this is the same place where updates and shared documents will routinely be provided. Next, we'd like to move on to address the organizational protocols. I know that each of you previously received a copy of the protocols to review and briefly discuss with the facilitators who scheduled your outreach sessions. Based on some of those discussions and the questions asked within, I would like to address a few of the concepts covered in that document. Primary and alternate committee members. We recognize primary and alternate committee members as a team representing their constituency. To that end, we value the input, expertise, and representation that both bring to the table. To carry out our virtual process, we must note several important distinctions. First, as uh, in previous in-person rulemakings, only the primary generally sits at the table. In an effort to replicate the main table and distinguish between our primary and alternates, when we enter into the substantive portion of our sessions, reviewing and negotiating over the topics, we will ask that alternators, all, I'm sorry, alternates and advisors turn off their cameras. Um, if the alternate is substituting for the primary for a topic um, uh, or a short, uh, uh, period of time, please send uh, myself or the FMS, FMCS team a note to that end, especially if you are not going to be there for an entire day or uh, um, in, in uh, the case this week, um, we will have one alternate sitting in the entire week. So after much consultation and consideration, this was the best virtual practice to easily delineate between those participating for the purpose of determining consensus. Um, alternate committee members will be invited to turn on their cameras when they are at the main table, and this might occur in several types of instances. In absence of the primary member, the alternate will participate at the main table and for the purposes of consensus. And I, again, 
I ask that you send us as much advance notice as possible. The primary and alternate negotiator may decide that the alternate will take the primary's place at the main table, either for a certain topic or to have an opportunity to briefly comment on a particular topic segment, subsection of a topic. The alternate would thus be on camera and the primary would turn their camera off for that portion. I hope that everyone understands the virtual and logistical intent behind this practice. Um, and would ask for advance notice again uh, when there is going to be uh, a swap. For the purposes of at the table and an alternate wants to like, you know, step in and, and make a comment. If you just put that in the chat, we will note it. Once we announce it, then uh, uh, you, uh, you can make that change. The same will work for advisors. When the committee or facilitators request their assistance and input, will ask that they come on camera to address the committee. The same is the case when the advisor requests to speak for the protocols, otherwise their cameras will remain off. Um, we will engage in consensus decision-making to develop proposed regulations. We will utilize good faith group problem solving to address the interests of the committee members and ultimately reach unanimous agreement, otherwise described as building consensus. It is not a majority vote, but rather an expression of agreement or dissent. And we have built consensus once there is no dissent by any member of the negotiating committee. Thus, no member or minority group can be outvoted. A few important notes here. Per the protocols, members of the committee should not block or withhold consensus unless they have serious reservations about what is being proposed. Absence at the time of consensus check will be the equivalent to not dissenting and will therefore not prevent consensus from being reached. To take the consensus checks, we will utilize a visual three thumb approach. The thumbs up, this is an expression of agreement by who is in agreement with and in support of the proposal at hand. A sideways thumb, this is also an expression of agreement. It is in fact an indication that one does not feel as strongly favorable to the proposal, but will support and agree with the proposal and not dissent. If everyone is a thumbs up or sideways thumb, you've reached consensus. If there, if there are thumbs down or even a single thumbs down, this is an expression of dissent by one who will not support the proposal at hand. If one or more individuals are a downward thumb, we are not in consensus and the dialogue and work continues during our remaining scheduled uh, time together, starting with the dissenters being asked if there are additional concerns other than what was presented in the discussion prior to the consensus check and asked to provide a change to what was proposed that would get them to consensus, either sideways or a total thumbs up. Finally, we will seek, be seeking consensus separately on each issue. This is different than some of the negotiated rulemaking experiences previously, but was utilized in the negotiated regulating rulemaking just that was just completed in December. We will not be seeking consensus on groups of issues or a complete package of all proposals. Rather, each issue will be subject to its own distinct consensus building. And as a result, those issues where consensus has not been reached will not hold back those issues for which consensus has been built and achieved. Throughout the process, we may take the committee's temperature for purposes of tentative agreement. This will help us in the department monitor where the committee is as a group with regard to specific issues proposals and solutions so that we can continue through the process towards building consensus. This will be done using the same three thumb approach. We will make it clear in any given instance, whether we are taking your temperature for purposes of tentative agreement or whether we are taking an official consensus check. Data and information requests and sharing. In an effort to streamline an, 
an effective and consistent process for sharing data and information, we request that materials be provided to FMCS and we will distribute them to the full committee. Um, so please email any of your data requests, um, proposals, anything like that directly to me and I will forward them to the parties that you indicate. Every, um, we will send them to all the negotiators. We will send them to the department and the department will be doing the same, sending it to us and we will disseminate it to all of you. Um, specifically for the advisors, this is a new, new role to have designated advisors for the committee. It was done in the last rulemaking. This is the second time that it's been done. And we want to utilize your expertise in a respectful and efficient manner. To that end, we would like to establish a consistent practice for soliciting data and information from them. In the effort to timely address requests, address potentially duplicitous requests, and ensure that everyone receives information and data being shared by the advisors. We ask that requests are provided again to the facilitators who will then in turn provide them to the advisors. Any materials and documents that the advisors wish to share can be provided by FMCS and we will send them out to everyone in, and the department. Our intent here is really to track requests and responses and ensure that everyone receives all data information being shared. For the department, data requests to the department, please refer to the protocols for additional information. These will be invited at the time of addressing the particular topic for which the party's um, request pertains. Any information provided by the department in response to a data request will be sent out to the entire committee. The department will prioritize data requests and please keep in mind that um, many if not most of the data requests may take a period of time to for the department to compile that information. Sometimes it has to come from multiple sources. In addition to um, that, we will be using breakout rooms and caucuses for the protocols. Committee members may request a caucus for the purpose of consultation. To achieve this within our Zoom Gov platform, the facilitators will move individuals into breakout rooms within the platform. These breakout rooms are secure and private virtual spaces where there will be no live streaming or recording. For time management purposes, the facilitators will work with the committee to ensure that these rooms are used um, intentionally and strategically for specific periods of time. It is no secret that we have a number of important topics to address in our limited time together. And we want to ensure that we're using each of your time during sessions most productively. In terms of participation, only those within the platform will be able to ac access the breakout rooms through Zoom. This means that we will not be able to admit any additional individuals to the meeting for the purpose of meeting with you in caucus. This is in no way an attempt to stifle dialogue, consultation, or the input of others from your respective constituencies. It is simply a matter of logistics, keeping the facilitators focused on the task at hand with the committee, preserving our time together and minimizing technical issues and protecting the security of our virtual meeting space. While in the breakout rooms, we encourage you to contact and consult with others as you deem appropriate and necessary. Feel encouraged to call them, use conference lines, speaker phones, or other preferred technology. We also encourage you to consult with them on breaks, lunches, outside session hours, and between sessions. Moving to the social media piece of the protocols, a couple of questions have come up about social media as it is addressed in the protocols. First and foremost, we ask that everyone refrain from posting and commenting on social media during our sessions together because we want everyone fully engaged and participating when we are together. Outside of our sessions, we appreciate that social media can be an effective tool for positive use, such as soliciting feedback from your respective constituency. 
Consistent with the protocols, however, all members shall act in good faith in all aspects of the negotiations and refrain from characterizing the views, motives, and interests of other members regarding negotiated rulemaking. You are all here because you have expertise. We're nominated by the public and selected by the department to work together in good faith and strive to reach consensus on a number of very important issues. Each and every one of you are valuable to the process and we ask that you treat each other accordingly. Finally, it has previously been conveyed that your agreement to serve as a negotiator indicates your willingness to follow these pro protocols. We are going to ask you at this time to approve the organizational protocols as provided. This will be our first opportunity to use our thumbs and achieve agreement. Does this committee agree with formally adopting the protocols? If I could see your thumbs. Okay, it looks like we have all thumbs up. Anyone see something different than that? Please let me know. All right, so thank you very much. We will reflect that adoption in our records. You have now just reached your very first consensus. What a great way to start off your day. Before moving into a brief review of our agenda, does anyone have any questions or comments? Cindy, we have one more alternate, David Zocolo, representing the Agencies for Ability to Benefit. Okay, so when we move into Ability to Benefit, David Sokolov will be sitting at the main table. Thank you, Raz. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so um, a review of the agenda. This was emailed out and shared online by the department. Yeah. Uh, Anne, you have your hand up? Sure, I just wanted to note that I had also sent in a request that for the community colleges, will Durden be our primary negotiator for the ability to benefit? Yes, thank you. I did receive that. I will be announcing all changes when I introduce the uh, issue, um, but thank you for that, Anne. Um, the email, the agenda was emailed out and shared online by the department. Um, this is the order in which we plan to introduce topics during this first week long session. I must let you know that it is subject to change based on a number of potential factors. Quick note on public comment. At the end of each day that the committee meets, we will reserve time for public comment, which will begin each day from 4 to 4.30 um, when we start uh, our schedule of uh, ending at 4, public comment will be 3.30 to 4. At that time, individual public commenters will be admitted into our Zoom.gov meeting from the waiting room and permitted three minutes to speak. They will be removed from the session when their remarks are complete. Along those lines, we the department does um, uh, slot people into every three minute time slot during the period of open comment from four to 4.30. Once those slots are filled, people will be placed on a waiting list and should time slots open up during that half hour, and we have gone through everyone who uh, was scheduled, um, there sometimes are those who cannot make it. We will then move to the um, waiting list in an effort to make sure that we get as many people as possible in that half hour. Okay, that is all I have in terms of opening statements. Um, is there anything that that um, the committee wants to bring up before we move into our first issue of ability to benefit? Uh, yes, Cindy Hyde's Johnson. Um, I had a motion to add a person to the negotiated rulemaking committee. Should I make that now? Um, yes, please go ahead. So um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to meet you all. I'm Johnson Tyler from the uh, Legal Aid uh, constituency. Oh, we want to add a civil rights seat to the um, negotiating making committee table. Um, the person we'd like to um, 
uh, Ame is Amanda Martinez, who works UNIDOS in uh, a Latinx advocacy organization in uh, Washington, D.C. Um, the uh, civil rights um, seat was originally a, uh, its own entity, uh, and it got collapsed into a consumer and civil rights seat. I think these two issues are fairly different, and that's why we want to um, make this nomination. In addition, um, I'm, I'm aware that we're I'm making this on the Tuesday after Martin Luther King weekend, um, where we're celebrating his achievements. And I think all of us would agree the last uh, two years, we've become acutely aware of the inequalities in the United States that have persisted despite his efforts. Um, economists have been looking at it. The Federal Reserve issued a report showing that uh, uh, what the wealth gap between African-Americans and whites is greater than it was in 1968. Um, and there's lots of data about um, student loan inequality and in outcomes. Um, we all are here because we care about education and care about uh, its uh, ability to hopefully transform our, uh, our society. Um, but I think we all have specialties that do not include civil rights uh, and consumer law is largely based on consumer statutes. Uh, and that's what I and a lot of other people here use. So having someone who's deeply immersed in um, civil rights issues and, and looking at things through the lens of, of race would really be helpful. Uh, and that's why I'm uh, nominating Amanda. Uh, and I'm happy to put in her resume and a recommendation from various organizations that have been provided. Um, uh, Cindy also has it if she, if she thinks it's more appropriate for her to put it in the chat. Um, I. Uh... Thank you, Johnson. I did email that to uh, the, the negotiators so they oh, have it okay. in. Um, I, um, at this point, um, the, the department needs to know, I need to have verification from Ms. Martinez that she is in fact available and ready to join the committee if the committee reaches consensus to add her. I am awaiting that confirmation from her. Okay. Johnson, do you have any? Yeah, I, I, I've been communicating her by email. I can call her and have her contact. She says she's watching right now and is okay. committed if to she, participate. If she could send me an email real quickly, sure. um, confirming that, yes, she is available and willing to join us um, today throughout for the whole entire rulemaking. Um, if once I get that confirmation, I will uh, move your um, proposal to the committee for consensus. Okay, great. I'm gonna go to my email and try to uh, okay. send her this. All right, as we await that, is there anyone else? Jalen. I would just like to say that some from the coalition of our consumer advocates and civil rights coalition that we have built in the constituency that we are represented do support the nomination that Johnson is moving forward with. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other business to take care of while I um, see if uh, Ms. Martinez can quickly respond to us? Ernest has his hand up, Cindy. I'm sorry. Who Looks does? Like it's like he Okay. Nope, it's back up again. I'm sorry. Ernest? Ernest, Ernest okay. No, that's okay. Um, I would also uh, just super quickly like to offer uh, my support and support of the seat, both to the addition of a specific civil rights seat um, and my support for Amanda Martinez in particular at the seat, um, of course, pending her uh, uh, willingness and ability to, to, to do it. Um, I would uh, flag that um, Amanda has been a negotiator before and critically uh, she was a negotiator representing students uh, in 2019, uh, the distance education set of negotiated rulemaking. Um, her voice on this committee in particular would be extremely valuable. Um, and if I might say, I might say extremely beneficial considering uh, kind of the slant uh, on this current seat and the lack of representation of, of student facing seats, uh, we know she's well equipped to do it. So. Uh, I simply wanted to add my support in that regard as well. Okay, thank you. Brad? Yes, good morning. Uh, while we consider the vote on the nomination put forth by our colleagues, I would like to nominate someone to the committee. Um, many of the issues we'll be negotiating on during this upcoming 
rulemaking session directly impact proprietary schools. And according to 2020 IPEDS data, there are approximately 2,270 taxpaying proprietary institutions with only 330 of those schools having programs four years or longer like South College. Prior uh, gainful employment rulemaking sessions, proprietary schools had two voting seats, one for private proprietary institutions with an enrollment of 400 students or less, 450 students or less, and the other with proprietary institutions with enrollment of 451 students or more. And thus, with South College having 7,000 students, uh, we do not have a representative covering for smaller proprietary schools. As many of you know, the 2014 Gainful Employment Rule established debt to earning measures to determine whether a program prepares students for gainful employment in a recognized occupation. And under the 2014 Gainful Employment Rule, the department obtained it was currently available mean and median annual earnings of students who completed the gainful employment program for the social, from the Social Security Administration. And we know in the Department Gainful Employment uh, issue papers recognize that educational programs that produce graduates in fields were underreported. Income occurs is a challenge for any measure that includes income reported to a federal agency. Given that fact that many of the issues we are negotiating on today impact proprietary institutions, and looking around the virtual table with all due respect to my com committee colleagues, we would benefit from adding someone to the committee who is at a smaller school with programs less than two years in length, has significant knowledge and experience with occupations that rely heavily on tips, such as barbering, cosmetology, and massage therapy. So I would like to formally nominate Michael Hallman to the committee. Michael proudly served our country in the US Marine Corps from 1978 to 1986. Currently, he is the president of the American Institute of Beauty, which operates two campuses in the state of Florida, offering programs in beauty and wellness with enrollment of 300 students. Additionally, he is current chair and president of the American Association of Cosmetology Schools, which represents 500 plus schools across the country. He is the founding member and current board of director of the Florida Association of Cosmetology and Technical Schools. Uh, Michael is actively involved in state and federal advocacy on behalf of students attending schools that offer cosmetology, barbering, and massage programs. Michael is listening this morning and he's prepared to participate immediately if the committee accepts him. You can put his LinkedIn bio in the chat for reference. Thank you, Brad. I need to hear directly from your nominee as to whether or not they will accept it. So um, I Would still have not- suffice? Pardon me? Would an email suffice? Yes, okay. yes. Um, Still have not heard show from um, Ms. Martinez either. So in an effort to, to move things along um, and not hold the committee up from the work that they uh, have at hand, um, I'm going to move us to um, the first issue of ability to benefit um, as that is a discussionary piece um, at this point. At such time that I receive confirmation from either party, I will um, bring the committee back around to the addition of uh, addressing the addition of these two. Brian, I'm not sure what constituency are you are you suggesting uh, that you that Michael uh, represent? Um, proprietary schools with enrollments of 450 students. South College being regionally accredited with 7,000 students has uh, different different issues than what a cosmetology school offering programs with two years or less uh, would have. Okay, so the, this, this is a seat that was there in I believe the 2017 negotiation of gainful employment. Um, and I was just asking that seat to come back. Okay, so would your the name of the constituents would be proprietary schools with less than 400 stu with students 400 students or less enrolled. 450 students. 450. Okay, thank you. Um, I have received confirmation from Ms. Martinez that she would she's formally confirming her ability to participate as civil rights negotiator for the institutional and programmatic eligibility committee. Um, so with that, that one, I think uh, we are able to uh, move that one to um, consensus. 
Um, at this point, I would like to ask all non-main table participants to turn your camera off so that we can readily identify just the uh, people who will be um, participating in the um, consensus. So we have one. I'm showing 15. And would it be appropriate to get a, some additional information? I, I haven't seen a resume on. I sent it to everyone this morning. I emailed it. You didn't did get it? I received that email. I, I, I did not get an email. I'm sorry. Uh, I wonder, it's probably out hanging out there in cyberspace. Um, Johnson, you want to pop those into the yeah, chat? Sure. Yeah. So we we also let me just. Okay, I also got uh, confirmation from Mr. Hellman that should the committee just, uh, reach consensus to add that constituency in him, he would be able to participate immediately. Um, are we ready to move on um, Ms. Martinez and the civil rights? Okay, if I can may, see. May, oh, may, I a, may I have a conversation with uh, Michael Johnson, please? Do you want a, a private conversation with him or what are you asking for? Yes, that would be excellent if I could. I'm not sure how to do that via this Zoom format. That's okay, we will set it up. So you want to caucus with whom? I believe it is Mr. Michael Johnson. Tyler. Recommended. Who is M Michael Johnson? I think he means Tyler. Sorry, Tyler Johnson. Sorry. Johnson Tyler. His first name is Johnson. I apologize. No worries. No worries. I made the same yeah. mistake. So we're good. Uh, Brady, can you set up that quick breakout room? Brad, can you give me some sort of indication as to uh, how long this caucus will take? Assume five minutes or less. Okay. So for the purposes of the public, we are setting up a breakout room um, for Johnson Tyler from legal aid organizations and Bradley Adams from proprietary institutions. We will go off live stream for the period of time that it takes uh, for them to do it anticipated to be five minutes. So with that, could we end the live stream?
Okay, welcome back everyone. The uh, caucus uh, has completed, so we're ready to move forward. Um, let's move with um, the first nomination of adding the civil rights seat with Ms. Martinez as the uh, nominee for that. If I could please see a show of thumbs. Uh, the 13. Okay, so the committee has reached consensus on that. So, Brady, if you would please send all the documents and materials and the link to Ms. Martinez so she can join the committee today, that would be great. Um, moving on to the um, proposal to add proprietary schools with 450 students or less with Mr. Michael Homlin as the uh, nominee. Um, if you could please uh, show me your thumbs. Okay, um, I am showing one. Please keep your thumbs up. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven. I am showing eight dissenters, so that um, proposal uh, did not pass. So moving on, um, we will move to the first topic that we have, and that is the ability to benefit. And Brad, you raised your hand. Yes, ma'am. I just want to state for the record, I'm disappointed that a critical voice will be missing from this conversation and the committee that uh, voted against it has that option uh, associated with it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, if you could please lower your hand, Brad, we will move forward with the ability to benefit uh, discussion. We have uh, several substitutions. David Sucklaw uh, will be in uh, substituting for Debbie Cochran. Will Durdham will be in for Ann Cress. Um, did I miss anyone? And of course, Yael is in all week um, for State's Attorney General Johnson. Yeah, um, could um, Brady or someone help Amanda to join the, the group too, since she's been. Uh, so she, she's been sent a Zoom link along with all the issues okay, and thank protocols. You. I'm just waiting to admit her. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, so with that, I, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Greg uh, from the department to um, uh, walk you through the uh, ability to benefit. Thanks, Cindy, I appreciate that. And uh, as was indicated, our first topic for the day will be ability to benefit. And uh, what I'll do is just uh, go through a brief intro uh, give a little bit of a, a background about ability to benefit for um, I understand that uh, not everybody on the committee you know um, is, is steeped in ability to benefit um, depends on where you've been working you know or what, what your background is as to how much uh, you know, regarding how much um, exposure you've had to it so and then once we go through the introductory part and a couple of the uh, um, main points we'll we'll start addressing the uh, the regulations themselves. So just as an introduction here, we're talking about uh, this is a uh, ability to benefit is in statute uh, section 484D of the HEA uh, that requires that in order to gain eligibility for Title IV federal student aid, a student without a high school diploma or its recognized equivalent must fulfill one of the ability to benefit alternatives. And they are as follows. A student can pass an independently administered ed approved ATB test. The student can complete six credit hours or the equivalent coursework offered by the post-secondary institution. A student who meets one of the uh, or or the third option is the participate in a state process that is approved by the department. Greg, student, yes. Could I interrupt for just a second? Do you want this document screen shared? Uh, uh, you, you, you don't have to put it up. I'll tell you when, to put, when you can put it up. 
OK, great. Thanks. I'll let you know when to put it up. That's just uh, uh, just after these introductory remarks. And so what we want to point out here is that a student that meets one of the ATB alternatives uh, may use that alternative to establish Title IV eligibility at any eligible institution where the student enrolls in an eligible career pathways program, ECPP. So that's eligible career pathways program. I hate to be the individual that introduces yet one more acronym to you all, but um, that, that I'm afraid I have to do that. So it's not the worst acronym we've ever had. So um, I will refer to it as uh, ECPP in the future. Again, that's eligible career pathway program, and that's defined in the HEA for purposes of the ability to benefit process. So the important point is here, no matter which means the student uses to uh, uh, to establish the ability to benefit, the only uh, way that that can take place is um, through an eligible career pathways program. And on that point, just a little bit of a background about um, about uh, about ATB. So um, just again, you know, what is ability to benefit? It is uh, we just talked about that being defined in the HEA, allowing students to participate um, or be eligible rather without a high school diploma or its equivalent. And um, we uh, talk about what is an eligible career pathways program. That's defined in the HEA as well. And then ECPP is a program that combines rigorous and high quality education, training, and other services that align with the skill needs and seven specific components that make up the ECPP. What is the state process? The state process describes the education services and supports that all programs operating within a given state process will follow. It must be approved by the department. Only institutions identified uh, by the state will be uh, able to participate in that process. A little bit of history of ATB before we move into it, just to, um, to look look at the, look at look to the past about where we have been with ATB and where we are now. So in 1991 and in 92, Congress created ATB via exam and the state process. There were for long for a long time there were, there were no states participating in the state process. So for the longest time, it really was only through the uh, through the exam that uh, the, those of those of you who are familiar with ATB know that um, students um, were able to uh, become eligible through this process. In 2008, Congress had a third option that was credit hours. So in uh, not just the uh, testing. Uh, or state process, we had the completion of credit hours that through which the student could establish ATB. And in 2008, uh, rather in 2011, Congress repealed ATB. You might recall that at that at that time, ATB, ATB went away completely. In 2014, Congress restored ATB with all three options and a new requirement that students must be enrolled in an ECPP. So it's important to remember that the Congress put back all three options for uh, establishing the ability to benefit. However, important caveat there is that the Eligible Career Pathways Program is the only mechanism through which uh, ATB can be accessed, whether it's through the uh, exam, whether it's through completion of the, the clock hours or credit hours, or whether it's through the state process. So looking at what ATB looks like today, in 2019-20 award year, approximately 240,000 students received Title IV aid uh, through ATB. Of those students, 86% accessed ATB by completing six credits. The remaining 14% accessed it by completing a test. I do want to point out that until recently, this, no state has utilized the state process provision. In 2020, the US Department of Education approved the first two states, that's Wisconsin and Washington. As of 2021, four state processes have been approved. Washington's application was the only one actively approved by the department. The other three were approved automatically due to lack of response within six months. That's statutory. If the department does not respond within six months, then the state process is automatically approved. In 2021, we have a fifth state submitted and no, no determination has been made there as of, as of yet. So that's a little bit of a background to, uh, to ATB, what we're looking at with ability to benefit. So with that, I think, Cynthia, we can put the paper up. OK, that sounds great. While we wait for that, I want to um, make note for the record that Ms. Martinez has now joined the meeting. Um, on behalf of the constituency group uh, civil rights. Um, in addition to that, I need to make note that uh, Michael Lanouette is at the table for Brad Adams for proprietary institutions. 
and that uh, Ashley Schofield will be joining the table in place of um, Beverly Hogan from uh, Minority Institutions. So back to you, Greg. Thank you. Let's move down to the, I, I think I pretty much covered the summary of issues there. So let's move down to the proposal section here to see uh, exactly what the department's proposing. And we're dealing with two areas really with, with our proposals for, a, for ATB. Uh, the, the first one will be uh, with respect to the uh, eligible career pathways process or program, and the second will be with the um, uh, with the state process. So those are the two main areas we're looking at, and they do intertwine. And you'll see as we go through the um, material how that works. So, firstly, the department is going to clarify how institutions demonstrate they offer ECPP. Currently, it is it has been in statute, but we've not regulated on this before, so this will be the first time that we um, that we regulate in this area. And um, although, as I said before, it is out, it is out in, um, in, in statute currently. The department is aware um, of compliance and program integrity issues, concerns uh, with programs that claim to offer an ECCP, ECPP rather, but do not offer all the required components and state process applications that have not provided robust data on student success. So with respect to ECPP, uh, the statute does require certain um, criteria be met, and we are um, seeking to uh, to put that into regulation. So first, we're going to provide clarity as to what is required to demonstrate to the department that a, that a program qualifies as an ECPP for the purpose of ability to benefit. So again, codifying this definition in regulation and providing detail on the types of documentation required to demonstrate that the program does meet the definition of an ECPP. Uh, the second point you see there is eliminate the requirement that first time applicants for the state process must demonstrate past performance metrics for the, for the initial period. Um, there is in current regulation a requirement that to be uh, approved, the state provide uh, certain performance uh, metrics to us and the problem with that is that if the state is coming in initially and uh, proposing this, uh, this this process, it's understandable that they will not have data at that point you know, to give us to uh, to uh, show us the success of the program. So for that reason, we are uh, we're regulating this in a way that I think will um, uh, makes a lot more sense uh, to allow the state to come in uh, initially and then provide us uh, with data after a certain amount of time. And you'll see uh, you'll see how that works. Um, so what we're going to have here, um, we we seek to recommend a maximum of two years of length, a two years length of time that the United States Department of Education should receive the application for approval, um, or on the length of time rather that we receive it. Second, the department's process requiring states to verify their applications that all new students served in the state process will be enrolled in ECPP, and the secretary shall verify that a sample of the proposed ECPPs are eligible. So when um, when states are applying, remember they can have a state process, but we're still requiring that that be through an eligible career pathways program. So we want to make sure that the participants are offering uh, this program in accordance with uh, what statute and statute and now uh, regulations will require. The department also seeks to propose a setting, uh, setting rather a maximum number of students to be allowed in the initial approval period uh, or limiting the institution to one ECPP for students um, eligible for the state process. So we'll be seeking feedback from all of you on the best approach for all that. And fourth, we are removing the requirements that states demonstrate past success rates for the initial period. And I already discussed that. that it's virtually impossible to do if you haven't had the, uh, the process before to demonstrate a success rate uh, without a trial period, which we're going to be introducing here. Uh, that's given that the state will not have prior data. However, we are proposing to replace that requirement with initial quality metrics that will allow us to assess the effectiveness of the program participating under the state process. And we seek feedback from negotiators on what those quality metrics ought to be. And finally, we are proposing requiring states to describe in their application uh, the enrollment or admissions criteria that students accessing Title IV through the state process uh, would be required to meet. And uh, moving on, we're, we're requiring that uh, 
there be clarity on the requirements or we're going to provide rather clarity on the requirements for states that are reapplying for subsequent approval of the state process. So when a state applies for a subsequent uh, approval from the department, the department proposes to require additional data and proof of success to meet the statutory requirement to demonstrate effectiveness. So you will recall that um, uh, there, there is a, a statutory requirement for uh, the state to demonstrate success in the program. We're also going to ensure that the success rate uh, that states demonstrate is appropriate. In order to demonstrate this effectiveness, the current regulation requires a completion rate uh, for participating students without a high school diploma or its recognized equivalent, that it must be 95% of the completion rate for students with high school diplomas. As we discussed just a few moments earlier, that's not really possible if the state has not had uh, time to run the program, hence the introduction of the trial period. Other alternative, uh, alternative performance indicators to be considered uh, include earnings, employment credentials, credits, uh, post-secondary transactions, or transitions rather. We also seek feedback on the most appropriate mechanism to hold states accountable when participating institutions do not meet the success rate thresholds. We also seek to establish reporting needed to retain access to Title IV to ensure states report institutional level data to the department when such data are not available uh, to the department through the standard Title IV reporting. That's an introduction of the uh, of what we'll be talking about here when we actually uh, look at the regulations. And um, if there are no questions at this point, I think I'd like to move to a discussion of the regulations themselves, uh, starting in the uh, uh, general provisions and our definitions of 668.2. And we can walk through this. I want to I want to make certain that we take this in um, chunks that are uh, reasonable so that we don't you know, go over too much uh, before uh, introducing discussion on that on that topic. I think that with what we have under 668.2, uh, we can we can address that uh, that that particular uh, what we have in that section. Um, and uh, and in paragraph B, we can we can start with that and, and start discussion on that. But before we get into that, does anybody have any preliminary comments or or, uh, or questions? Uh, Greg, there are several hands up um, and there was a question placed in the chat as well. Um, Sam? You are muted, dear. Thanks. Hi. Thank you. Um, I do have a question um, on the state process. Uh, Greg, when you gave the statistics, most students entered the program through credits and 14% through tests. Is it fair to say that students are not currently entering ATB uh, programs because of the requirements are unreasonable to have data in advance to go through the state program? Is that is that a fair assumption as to why the state option isn't currently being used? Um, you know, I don't know if I could say that that, that you know. Um, as far as the unreasonableness of it, I, I don't know if I like to use the word unreasonable. It's 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 a little unworkable. I mean, as as it currently is, uh, we did, as was pointed out in the introductory comments, approve one state. Uh, the other states that have been approved uh, were were done um, by default since we didn't take action during the six month period. Yes, it does put the department in a difficult position because. Currently, the regulations require the establishment of this 95% success rate uh, where these state processes are mostly are new. So there doesn't exist any data for them to give to us to, to show this. So it's a bit of a bit of a conundrum. We thought about it for the last couple of years, and it's one of the reasons why we put it on this negotiating table. Um, as to why, why only recently states have begun to participate to come into this, I think for a lot of years. Before ATB was taken away in 2011, it just became established that the, you know, that there was the um, test process and then the, uh, then the credits, and um, that just seemed to be what everybody did. I don't think there was a lot of interest in the states in applying. It wasn't that we didn't prohibit it; uh, it was certainly an, an an option that was out there. But you know, frankly, in my, I've been around for about 30 years in in this, and. Um, it just was something that was in the regulations that until very recently we just didn't get the application. So I don't 
I don't know without querying states, you know, where, where are there states that wanted to do it, but were uh, put off by that um, success rate? That's that's possible. Um, but I as I said, I just I just don't know uh, for sure. But it does seem that recently anyway, in the past couple of years, there's a lot more interest in the um, in the state in the state process, I think, than 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 there has been previously. But that's about all I can say about it, because, uh, you know, just for a lot of years, we just got no applications. Thank you, um, Johnson. Hi, thanks. Um, Greg, um, I, I missed the number of how many people are using this, and then they, related to that is, you know, you said at the beginning of the, the paper that there are integrity issues. Uh, I'm not, this is not an area of the, that I'm well versed in. Could you just expand a little bit on that? And so I'm curious, how many people is this impacting, and what are the integrity issues that you're concerned about? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to hit, I uh, will try to find, um, that figure. I think it was, I think it was 240,000 last year, but someone can, I'll have my, I'm going to ha ask my, uh, my um, colleagues in the department. That's to, good to, enough. I know it's a lot of people. Yeah, I think it was about 240,000. Uh, and take it now, I, so that I, I, I'll have that confirmed or denied to me shortly because I just don't want to fumble through the paper while I'm, uh, while I'm talking to all of you. Um, but as far as integrity issues are concerned, uh, we are concerned about, um, the uh, well, as I said before, with 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 respect to the state process, the current regulation is not really giving us what we what we need to uh, to put into place a viable way of uh, assessing these um, a viable means of assessing these programs. So we would be with the current regulations, we would be stuck with uh, you know approving without that success rate, um, uh, or. Uh, or, or just not approving, which we don't want to do that. So, I mean, we do, we wanted to introduce regulations that will allow us, will, will be fair to schools, I mean, rather fair to the states and schools in, in bringing up this process initially um, and then being able to provide us the data to, to, to go, uh, to evaluate the program. So, I, when we say integrity issues, I think it's, a, I mean, that's a, that's a, uh, that's an, a structural thing we're talking about here. I don't think we've identified a specific state that we found was doing something un untoward, um, but we uh, but we realized this could be there could be large numbers of students coming in with this process. Um, it is an alternate process, so we are concerned about uh, establishing um, integrity with that. With respect to eligible career pathways programs in general, uh, you may recall that we did put out a dear colleague letter uh, regarding uh, these um, programs because there was nothing in regulation, simply in statute. And uh, as far as integrity issues go, we are concerned. Again, this is not because we've ident necessarily identified in program review reports or audits specifically where this might be happening, but we do have concerns about the about the current structure allowing for a school to simply say, yeah, yeah, we have we have yes, we have a we have a uh, an ECCP uh, ECP eligible career pathways program ECPP, and just basically being able to say yeah, yes, we have that um, without there being anything. In regulation to hold that school to. So currently, uh, I, I think you know the department's um, opinion is that, or, or belief rather, is that there just isn't enough out there to ensure that when schools offer these ECPPs that they're, they're meeting the statutory uh, guidelines, and that's why we're putting it into regulation here. I think that will, it will help codify that and to make it clear that this is not just something you do because you just want to be able to take advantage of, a, of ATB again, that you want to, um, um, because con remember, if Congress had wanted to bring back ATB in its entirety, they could have done that. They, they didn't choose to do that. They brought it back completely within the context of an eligible career pathways program. So we feel that uh, we have a, a, an interest, the department of taxpayer students, um, in making certain that that process is being adhered to. Thank you, Greg. Um, David Sokoloff. Uh, yeah, hi, thank you. Um, and uh, Greg, I want, if I could, at this point to um, just, you know, before responding to the specific metrics on which you requested feedback, which I guess we'll get to one at a time, I just want to do some 
you know, response to the general frame you just said, especially about the congressional intent. Um, so first, applaud the department very much for clarifying what it takes to get the secretary's approval of a state process uh, to help students um, who have neither graduated high school nor have a equivalency diploma become eligible for Title IV student aid. Um, and I'm glad that there's a recognition that we need clarification about what's an eligible career pathway. But there's more that needs to be done in this reg uh, to make sure that ATB can actually uh, foster strong evidence-based integrated education and training programs, IET programs, that help this population make career progress and educational progress. Um, Well-designed uh, IET programs, as the department knows, can help students who don't have a secondary credential. Um, but poorly designed ones can saddle students with um, unsustainable debt, um, and um, and really, uh, you know, cause a lot of issues. That's why we asked the department for more data. You provided a little bit of data here, but we are looking for more data, which we did send a request in um, about how ATB is being used now. Um, you mentioned congressional intent. So as you said, seven years ago when ATB was partially revised, it was not a carbon copy of what had been eliminated in 2011. They carefully included the same definition of career pathways as in the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, WIOA, and it's now also in Perkins, uh, the Career Technical Ed Act. And so uh, it's clearly meant to restrict ATB for students served through real partnerships, true robust partnerships, coordinating adult ed under WIOA Title II with occupationally oriented coursework offered by a Title IV institution. And so as a state agency representative here, we are particularly involved in making these IET programs work. They require coordination. They require braiding of state funding and different streams of federal funding um, and, and a lot of uh, coordination among state and local entities and different institutions. Um, so this regulation is going to need to further clarify how an eligible career pathway is going to be documented for all three modes of the ATB, the, the six credit or uh, clock hours, the test or the state process. Um, you know, so what I'm hoping that we'll be able to do in this conversation is look at the body of knowledge uh, and guidance from coordinated programs. You know, the department's own Institute of Education Sciences put out a uh, research and practice guide on career pathways. Um, and obviously the experts at the Office of Career and Technical and adult ed uh, have a lot of research and uh, and guidance on IE. David, this is 30 second. Yeah, so I'm gonna suggest additional language to add to this red line uh, that, that you're probably walking through now to ensure that eligible career pathways for ATB is aligned with the other federal and state investments to accelerate dual enrollment for adults and not just, you know, and as you said, anyone who says they have a career pathway. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thanks, David. I, I do want to point out that um, your data request that uh, was submitted to us and is being worked on by our, uh, our colleagues in, uh, in federal students aid. And I also um, have a great uh, team of colleagues uh, supporting me here, which is a great thing uh, for me. And I do want to, I do uh, where I may have misspoken. I, I, I said earlier that uh, I wasn't aware of any uh, program review findings related to um, eligible career pathways uh, programs, but I was informed by our staff that we have indeed had some um, program review uh, related findings associated with eligible career pathways programs. So I do want to uh, correct myself on that note. And as far as any proposed language, we'll certainly be willing to take a look at that. And um, as we go through and, and see, look at what we have here, um, We'll discuss that if, if um, I mean, obviously the department feels that what we've presented uh, does uh, does accomplish the uh, what was just being just what they were just discussed, but we can start uh, with going through that. Do we have any other, uh, Cynthia, do we have any other uh, comments we need to take before we go into the reg? We do. We have two more comments and Greg, I'd like to point out there was a question um, put uh fourth in the chat when you were presenting from um michael lana michael do you want to pose that question since you've been waiting patiently 
Well, that's right. I was just wondering if the department could share how the 240,000 students were divided up by, sec uh, by sector. Uh, yeah, we do have we do have reporting uh, with ATB. Uh, schools are required to report, but we don't. Uh, someone from my from my group's gonna have to uh, clarify this. For me, we we know if it's we know if it's a test, um, and I don't think we have any way of. Um, and then we know we then we used to be reported if it's a test or or the six or the six credits. I don't think we have a mechanism for reporting state process, but I'll I'll wait for uh, um, they'll clarify that here for me. Um, hold on a second here. Um, that's not. I'll I'll wait for that. I'll, I'll wait for clarification on that. But I believe with that we used we use the uh, we use the reporting that we get. Um, when uh, schools use ATB and they're required to report to us that they have used it. So I think that's, um, uh, here we go. I'll pull this up now. Um, yeah, so just being confirmed to me by my uh, my colleague Aaron Washington that we have reported, uh, we have reporting for the six credits and the and the test. So that's currently all we've, all we have right now. We don't have a mechanism uh, currently uh, built in to collect uh, state to collect state process, so we can only break it down by by um, by those two mechanisms right now. By those two, by either the the test itself or us or um, um, or the six credits. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple things before we move. We have two comments left, Jamie and Will. I do want to welcome Miss Amanda Martinez to the table for the newly added constituency of civil rights. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, welcome Amanda. I also want to point out that Ashley Schofield has come to the table in place of Beverly uh, Hogan for minority representing institutions. And I think those are the only two changes at this point. So with that, Jamie. Thank you. Um, I first learned about ATB in 1993, but on behalf of those of us learning about ECPP in this process, uh, it would be helpful, Greg, if you could tell us, um, does this, a couple of simple questions, I think. Does, do these provisions affect in any way ATB students at other than ECPP programs? Are ECPP programs exclusively or almost entirely ATB students who have not yet, um, who are in dual enrollment or other kinds of programs, or are there mixed enrollments at these programs um, that would allow comparison between people who have a traditional high school diploma and others? Um, then a, a thumbs up for the department on the, the notion of having initial and renewal conditions. I think that's a, a thoughtful and creative way to think about what you can know at the beginning and to start on a contained basis. But just a, a little bit about the ECPPs to understand the scope of uh, these provisions. Yeah, Jamie, and um, oh, thank you. Thanks for the kind words regarding our efforts. Uh, we, we always appreciate that, first off. Um, as far as uh, these programs are concerned, um, we, you know, we are we certainly are aware of the fact that there have been uh, um, career uh, uh, career pathways programs um, in existence, and we are introducing the con the the, the uh, title here of an eligible career pathways program. Um, we. Uh, I think, and I, I don't, I don't have any data or statistics on it, but I'm certain that there are uh, career pathways programs out there that you know students are participating in um, that uh, that are not involved in ATB. So I don't think that there's an uh, that there's an exclusive um, there. Uh, but the important thing to remember here is that since since whether or not a student is taking let's just take the state process out of it completely, if a student is um, going to establish eligibility by taking by uh, demonstrating ATB either through the test or through the approved tests or through the six credits or the or the um, requisite clock hours, um, then it still has to be an eligible career pathways program. So there's no other 
uh, there's no other entry point or gateway ATB other than the Eligible Career Pathways Program, regardless of which particular means the student uses to establish that. So whether it's through a state process or test or, or uh, credits, the the uh, the Eligible Career Pathways Program has to be there. So that's why um, you know we're talking about exactly what uh, trying to make a distinction between career pathways programs that might be out there, which which may or may not meet all of these these statutory criteria that, that we have here for an eligible career pathways program. But but yes, I think you're right. Your point about it being able, it, could it be a mixed, um, could it be a mixed group of students? Um, yes, I mean, there could be students in, enrolled in uh, career pathways programs. Um, uh, there could be students enrolled in, in, in a program that meets the eligible career pathways program and all the uh, all the rigor that 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 necessitates, but um, that are not um, accessing through uh, uh, um, through AT through uh, ATB. Although um, you know, if you're in, a, in I mean, an eligible career pathways program has a dual uh, mechanism through which students are uh, taking the post secondary credential and also uh, having a pathway to a uh, to a high school diploma as well. So one would suspect that in the majority of cases, these these students. Um, uh, if they're accessing Title IV, uh, uh, don't have a high school diploma. Cindy, may I ask a clarifying question? Sure, go ahead. Um, is this the only quality screen that the Career Pathways Program has to go through? Is this where you get, the, is this where the control about whether it is good enough um, takes place, as opposed to all of the other things we're going to be talking about. Well, yes, as we walk through the rule, you'll see we'll start with the definition of a career pathways program. So there's the definition. What what are the elements of a career pathways program? And what you'll see here in B is taken from the from the statute. And then there are the uh, then we also are uh, proposing to regulate how a school demonstrates that it um, that it that it has done this uh, beyond just saying you know, yes, we, we have it. What what means uh, does the school have to uh, mechanisms rather does the school have to, to use to demonstrate to us that it is an eligible career pathways program? I mean, currently it, it does have to meet these statutory criteria, but but um, but we will be putting it into regulation, and we've not and, and we've not before um, uh, been specific about how a school has to demonstrate this. In our dear colleague letter, we essentially just reiterated the statute and left it at that. So we are introducing a, a, a higher level of, uh, I think, of program integrity here with, uh, with this. OK, thank you. Um, all right, uh, Will, you are up next. Thank you, Cindy. Good morning again. Will Jordan uh, in Washington State with one of those approved plans. So thank you, Gregory, and the department for the state plans that have been approved so far. Uh, I think we were the second state in the nation, and we've been pleased to see some hearing of other applications come in as well. I uh, I really want to second uh, Mr. Sokolow's comments, and to that end, won't reiterate what's been said in the interest of time. Uh, also want to make a few general comments to really uh, highlight just how important, just how critical this work is for us uh, and how uh, how much it matters that we get this right. So we're pleased to be at the table here. We designed um, our state strategic plan in the community and technical college system in Washington State uh, explicitly to leverage the potential for ability to benefit uh, with our career pathways that our colleges offer through our guided pathways initiative, which we uh, which fits well with career pathways, our state IET model, which is IBEST, nationally recognized, and our competency-based high school completion program, High School Plus. So ability to benefit for us is a core component of our state strategy to lead with racial equity. It's really connected to and central to our equity efforts in state to transform lives within a culture of belonging that advances racial, social, and economic justice in service to our diverse communities. We took our state financial aid system, the Washington College Grant, and lined up the eligibility rules with federal ATV so that we could have a state and federal ability to benefit package easier to administer in the state because the rules match. Uh, that has really helped colleges braid state and federal resources to support students. So it's a core recruitment and strategic enrollment strategy for us to bring more underserved students, including students of color, into our high wage, 
high demand programs. I'll have uh, additional comments at, at specific points uh, in the regs, but I uh, just want to uh, note that, you know, we I like the, uh, the eligible career uh, pathway program, the ECPP. It has taken us a lot of time to help colleges feel comfortable with those criteria. Uh, we've often felt confident that the colleges are meeting that criteria, but they don't always have that same level of confidence. And to that end, uh, I don't see it as an additional burden or an additional accountability measure. I really see it as uh, support and guidance for institutions to feel like they know that there's a process that says, yes, we have an ECPP and we can feel good about that. So we absolutely welcome efforts uh, from the department to ease and help institutions use this. Uh, I, I'm surprised by the 240,000 figure. I thought it would be uh, much lower. So I'll be curious to see where the state distribution of that is and the industries and the other information that comes out on that. 30, 30 seconds. Okay. I was just going to give you your 30 seconds. Thanks, Will. And again, okay. thanks for the kind so, words, too. I appreciate that. All right. Seeing no other hands, Greg, do you want to move us forward? I could do that. So we'll I think we'll move into our first uh, our first regulation. So it's a milestone here as we uh, as we get started on uh, on uh, on um, ATB. So I think what we'll do is uh, thinking about the protocol for this. We'll discuss a uh, in this case we're doing. Uh, well, it's not the entire section of 668.2. It's just um, our, our the pertinent part of that of that section that we're dealing with with today. Again, uh, 668.2. Uh, is that is a general uh, definitions in the uh, in the general provisions so we have added this is a this is a brand new regulation and um we have added uh, this is coming up on the screen now thanks vanessa um the definition of an eligible career pathways program so just want to point out that as we go over this we're gonna, we'll, we'll take all of b and then go through it then discuss but i want to point out that um this is just the definition. So we're not getting into anything here about what schools have to do to demonstrate that they meet this requirement. Um, we're just talking about the definition of the career path of the eligible career pathways program at this point. So I will walk through it. Um, our proposed definition: an eligible careers path, another eligible career pathways program, a program that combines rigorous and high quality education, training, and other services that aligns with the need skill needs of industries in the economy of the state or regional economy involved prepares an individual to be successful in any of a full range of secondary or post-secondary education options including apprenticeships registered under the act of august 16 commonly uh, known as the national apprenticeship act includes counseling to support an individual in achieving the individual's education and career goals includes as appropriate Education offered concurrently with and in the same context as workforce preparation activities and training for a specific occupation or occupational cluster. Organizes education training and other services to meet the particular needs of an individual in a manner that accelerates the educational and career advancement of the individual to the extent practical. Practicable rather and enables an individual to attain a secondary school diploma or its recognized equivalent or at least one recognized post-secondary credential and helps an individual enter or advance within a specific occupation or occupational cluster so those are our that is our uh, proposed definition under b and uh, having uh, gone over that definition i would invite uh, any comment on that Sorry about that. I had a trouble getting my mouse to cooperate with me. No problem. Uh, thanks, Greg. Um, Kelly has her hand up. Good morning. I just I have a question on um, where it talks about enabling an institution to uh, individual to obtain a secondary diploma. Um, does that? Can you clarify whether or not that means that a school um, would just need to? offer a way for them to obtain that or that it becomes something that they actually have to obtain that that they have to get that diploma i guess what i'm saying is you know schools are going to offer or disperse aid um based on outcomes that haven't happened yet 
are they going to be retroactively penalized if the students do not actually obtain that secondary diploma? Or do they just need to provide the ability for them to obtain it? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, to, to answer it uh, uh, broadly, no, we are not. Re these regulations are not requiring that in order uh, for the uh, uh, student to have been eligible if there's going to be a retroactivity test of whether the students um, did complete the uh, the high school uh, credential. How, having said that, though, I don't want to, it's extremely important to us um, that the means um, to obtain the high school diploma be real and um, and are moving students toward this. The whole the whole idea of this, you know, of this of this eligible career pathways program is the student is that the student emerge with the um, post secondary credential and also get the high school diploma. I think we we all are aware of the fact that irrespective of whatever else a student may do, uh, it's important to obtain uh, for people to obtain that high school that high school diploma. It's it's an important milestone in people's lives and it's been shown to be. Uh, um, to be of great importance economically and, and socially in other ways. So, but no, we are not, and you'll see, I think we're gonna go through the through the def, through the uh, through the regulation, the proposed regulations, and you'll see how we propose to uh, bring integrity to that process of um, of uh, making certain that the that the pathway is there. Um, however, again, we we are, we are not we are not proposing that there be a uh, in other words, if uh, the student does not ultimately obtain the uh, the, the uh, high school credential, would the student lose eligibility? No. Uh, with or would the uh, would the eligible career pathways program become uh, ineligible? Uh, no. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, I have lost my screen. I'm going to log out of the meeting. Commissioner Brady Roberts will step in until I can get this uh, screen back. Good morning, everyone. Yes, yeah, and you just let me know um, when your screen's back in here again. Uh, Sam, I see your hand next. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. I have a question regarding item number one here, aligning uh, with the skills needed in the economy of the state or the regional economy. And I'm curious how that will be demonstrated and or measured as an outcome. Um, is this something like the TEACH grant proposal, which which can be very difficult um, to, um, to monitor. And also I think restricted some students, right, who maybe didn't want to stay in the state or region once they achieved their credential or their skill. They might want to take that skill somewhere else where it is needed. So uh, can you describe how that will work uh, in more detail, Greg? Yeah, we, we will get to, we will get to that. Um, you're talking about um, again, just for uh, um, back to my document here. Clarity's sake, with uh, with uh, aligns with the skill needs of industries in the economy or of the state. Um, yes. Yeah. What we would so what we're looking for here is again we're going we're going to get into um, uh, more detail about uh, about the ECPP itself, but. Um, uh, what we uh, are looking for here is that there be a real, uh, on the part of schools, a real um, assessment of, uh, you know, did you look at what's uh, what skills, uh, what skill, what the skill needs were uh, in the economy of the state or the, or the regional economy involved, and uh, certainly within the context of the state process, we will have states doing that. Um, with, but again, uh, this is available. You don't have to go through the state process in order to participate to have an eligible career pathways program. So, at, with schools, we would be looking to see, um, you know, what what measures the school took um, in designing the program. Like, you know, what what data did you look at to determine um, whether or not this aligns uh, with with industry with, the, with industry needs? Um, you know, out there looking at what 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 jobs are. Uh, Available, uh, what uh, you know, what what uh, pay levels are, what the economic success rate is of these of these students, and what we're really what we're really trying to prevent, not allow to happen here, is you know for for there to be a summary uh, sort of a summary um, judgment that oh yeah we you know we have a we have an X program and everybody knows that uh, the world needs whatever this is so therefore sure there's a uh, there's a skill need in the state for this. Um, but you actually have to have looked 
at data and and applied that uh, to um, you know to to that decision. Um, I, I I don't you know as far as this kind of thing goes, I think we all have to be we all have to be uh, cognizant of this, honest about this that um, the uh, that this is not um, um, this is not like you know how many days it, you have to make it an R two T four payment. You know there is a certain amount of um, uh, it's not quite as objective as that, but I do want to. Uh, we will get to that, and I, I, I point out. I'll point out here that that we're going. This is described in um, in six sixty eight one fifty seven that we will get to. So I'll just read the definition there now. We we will get to that point, but I'll read it now. The program aligns with the skill needs of industries in the state or regional labor market in which the in which the institution is based or located. Based on research the institution has conducted, again, as, I, as I pointed out already, it can't just be yes, we teach X and everybody knows people need to hire that. So um, and that would be government reports in, the, in, in identifying occupations with the greatest hiring demand in the state, region, in the regional market, surveys, interviews, meetings, or other information obtained by the institution. So you can see here we're not being 100% uh, prescriptive. There, there is obviously some subjectivity involved here that we uh, um, um, we can't uh, that we can't entirely take out but uh, this is this is statutory and um, this is uh, how we intend to regulate it we'll we'll get to that and um, we're not there yet but we will get there but I just wanted to read that because um, that the question was asked so that's how we intend to put it into regulation um, as, as far as like uh, um, being any more prescriptive than that I, I don't you know, so we're not saying you know exactly which government reports, which surveys, which interviews. I mean, just establishing the fact that this has to be researched uh, and, and not just um, not just eyeballed. And I want to thank my colleague Aaron Washington for, uh, for for pulling that up for me. Just as a thank quick you. note, I think Cindy, you're back and ready to go. So I am. Oh. Yes. Thank you, Brady. Uh, Amanda, you are next. Hi all, thank you. Well, one, I just wanted to introduce myself. Thank you all for, for the vote of confidence. It's uh, great to be here and I'm excited to learn and uh, ask all the questions and hopefully come out with a better outcome for students who've been historically excluded from the higher education sector or been taken advantage of. Um, so just kind of a context, I have two questions, but before I get into my two questions about this specific issue paper, I did want to remind folks, you know, that the K through 12 sector has been also laden with many issues. Um, so those students who are currently maybe didn't complete high school or had issues with their high school education, that's coming from a longstanding history of, of, of as we know, is, uh, segregation in our higher and in our K through 12 system, which continues to be actually worsen a uh, worsened uh, segregation within our high schools and the quality of education that students, especially black and Latinx students are receiving. Um, so I'm particularly you know, interested in seeing the intention of schools using this ability to benefit. Um, you know, the, the definitions here are really important because we wanted to make sure that the students who maybe didn't receive the best high school education or not by their own choice or at their own fault, but really at the institutional level and are still interested in, you know, pursuing their career goals and achieving additional educational opportunities that what, you know, whatever opportunities that they're provided or seeing to, which could be through this, this pathway that states um, are, are hoping to utilize that they are of quality, that they're not once again, being given a worst outcome. Um, so that's my introduction. I will then ask me two questions that hopefully uh, the Department of Education can answer. In this, so my first question, the specific, um, the definition that we're going over right at, at the moment, eligible career pathway program, you know, it says in the, our issue papers that this was taken from or inspired by the definition drawn from statute. Is the, are each of these line items specifically, you know, was there anything that was added or separated from the statute or is this exactly replicated from the statute definition? I was just interested if you can just make those or differences for me. And then my second. Wait a second. Oh, go ahead. 
Um, the second question is that in line three includes counseling to support an individual. How else are you, is that really the definition of counseling? How are you defining what quality counseling is? Is that academic, non-academic? It's not really included there. So I'm wondering if there are other regulations that can help support what includes counseling really means. How, you're def how are you assessing its quality of counseling? Okay, I'll, I'll take the first question. Uh, our, our, uh, our definition as proposed here uh, pretty much mirrors the statute. That's um, to my knowledge, we have not um, added anything there, but I'll, I'll ask my, um, my colleagues um, to, uh, to uh, weigh in in the chat with me about, about that. But that, that's taken from the statute. As far as the uh, second question um, about the career counseling, again, we're going to be, um, um, and my uh, my colleague has Aaron has just told me that and uh, confirmed that this is pretty much cut and pasted from statute. So even even a higher level than what I said, uh, I would I would um, it acts exactly taken from statute. Um, regarding the, the the counseling, so again we're I'm jumping forward to 668.157, where if you look in your papers, if you want to just because 668.157. Uh, is not the definition of a career pathways program, but it's um, where we say an institution demonstrates to the secretary that a student enrolled in an eligible career pathways program as required um, in 668 156A3 uh, um, documents uh, documents this by uh, in the following ways, and then we lay out how that's documented, and we do have uh, the career counseling aspect there that the program provides career counseling services that assist students in obtaining jobs aligned with the skill needs described in paragraph two of this section and identifies the individuals providing the counseling services. So what we did there uh, to your point about um, bringing a, an, an added measure of, uh, of integrity to this beyond just uh, yes, we yes, we provide those services is actually requiring the school to, to uh, indicate who does provide these services so that we can, I, um, you know, if they'll have to list list people, those individuals, uh, you know, we can definitely uh, in any type of a compliance setting uh, say, you know, which individuals provide this and then determine do these people actually provide the, the career service, the career counseling services, because I think that um, the uh, um, important thing here is that they're actually, this is actually taking place, not just to check the box, you know, yeah, we provide services, a student asks us a question, we'll, we'll answer it. You know, are there real career, is there real career counseling going on? And, and, and again, we're, we're, in, we're in a subjective area where, you know, you, that's, that's to some extent the judgment call. And I don't think there's any way out of that uh, entirely, but, it's, but I think it's um, important that we do, we do look at that. So that would be the way we intend to, uh, to enforce that. And I can, I can say that the department is, um, is very serious about uh, that when when a school says we meet these criteria, that they actually that they actually do. And I also want to say to uh, Amanda, welcome. And um, takes a lot of guts to be back. I think she's a she's a veteran of my. Uh, uh, I think she was on the uh, subcommittee for uh, uh, distance and innovation. So uh, the fact that she's back with me does say something about her uh, about her tenacity and willingness to uh, go back out again. Thanks, Greg and Amanda. Will, you are up next. Thank you. One question on item five in that list. I recognize it's in statute and we're just seeing it again here. Uh, but uh, any comment on, on what acceleration or acceleration to the extent practical, uh, how that was interpreted by the department and how they might look at regulating that? I'm sorry, which, uh, which, Oh, I'm sorry. I was. You said item number. Uh, item number, number five. Right? Five. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, um, organizes education, training, other services to meet the PIP needs of an individual in a manner that accelerates the educational career advancement of the of the individual to the extent possible. Um, I. Uh, I don't, I, again, with the acceleration, I, I, I'll, um, I'll ask my colleagues to weigh in with 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 that. That that, that is statutory language, um, and I think uh, you know what we're looking at here is a uh, 
looking at the looking at the uh, um, the individual student and what uh, what will uh, you know what will advance that 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 student's uh, placement um, to the extent that that's practical because the whole purpose of this career pathways program is to you know we're not we're generally not talking about um, uh, students who are um, you know traditional students in a in a in say a four year program so we're trying to uh, the whole goal here is to get these students started into into a uh, into a career. We haven't been we haven't been prescriptive about this um, and, and we don't when we're not in these regulations either. But um, I, I think that, you know, I, I would say that this, you know, if you want to say, well, what, you know, could, could we define accelerates? Well, I think it'd be a little difficult to do. Um, but again, the whole idea of this is a career. It's a career pathways. It's supposed to be able to take a student from a certain point. And move that student into a uh, into 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 a job and into a career, not just a job, into a career, and that we expect that to to uh, uh, this program to be something that you know uh, increase that pace beyond maybe what the student could ordinarily accomplish without benefit of the without benefit of the program. So I think that's where the that's where the accelerant the accelerate. Um, don't want to say the word accelerant, not a chemistry class. Um, that's where the acceleration aspect of this occurs. Hey, thank you. Um, seeing no other hands on this uh, 668.2 definition, um, would, would it be, um, do you want to take a temperature check on this at this point, Greg, just to see where the committee is lying on I that would. section? Okay. Yes, I would. Thank you. All right. You are welcome. So uh, remember, a temperature check is it's it's not consensus. It's just to check to see where the committee falls. I do know that um, there have been statements that additional text may be um, presented throughout this ATB. But this is just on the the language that is out there on 668.2 only for a temperature check. So the department has some sort of understanding of where the committee as a whole. Um, where their thoughts are. So with that, if, if I could please see thumbs and please hold them high because sometimes it's a little hard to see. So if I could see your thumbs, I would appreciate it. Okay, I'm not seeing any thumbs down. Um, so hopefully that is helpful uh, for the department. Uh, on 668.2. That I want to thank you all for that. Um, so that brings us to the next section, right? Uh, Johnson, you have a question? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, um, this is a, a late question for Greg, but so the ECCP or ECPP, this applies to all sectors. It doesn't apply just to the, the nonprofit or the Private nonprofit, is that correct? That's correct. Um, we don't. We do not limit um, access to ability to benefit by uh, by institutional type. I, I think, uh, you know, largely it probably is uh, either uh, uh, career schools or um, community colleges. But uh, but that's not that's not uh, not limited. Um, and um, again, the eligible career pathways uh, program. Uh, I have to make sure I get the acronym right myself. I was working at ECPP, not ECCP. ECPP is um, is uh, a, a prerequisite for any, for accessing any of any ATB. So I think if you look at it like that, like that, that's the basis. You have to have that, and then moving to either the uh, state process or the uh, test or the or the credits. But but yes, it is a universal. Uh, it's universally applicable. Okay, so we have about um, roughly 14 minutes before the scheduled lunch break. Greg, do you want to start into 668.32? Yeah, I think so. I don't want to. I don't want to waste the time. Although I've, anybody who knows me knows what a compulsion I have about lunch, so I'm always I'm always tempted to uh, <laughs> always tempted to go to lunch, but I'm not going to do that in this capacity. So um, we will start with. Uh, we will start with 668.32, and I think that um, um, we will uh, begin with that. And I and I I think with 32 as well, we can walk through what we have. Um, 
and just hold on one moment. And we'll walk through 32. This is and just just to clarify, this is student eligibility. And remember, I want to I want to point out that when we're presenting you, it probably goes without saying. But I just want to uh, I just want to reiterate that obviously all of 66832 is not here. That's the, the uh, uh, asterisks are, indicate that they're you know we're just putting the applicable portions in here. But this is the student eligibility um, uh, section of the uh, of the regulations, and we're only putting we're only giving you here what is applicable to uh, what we're doing with respect to. Uh, to ATB. So um, let's take a look at this uh, at the student eligibility and I will. This is not very lengthy, so I'll walk through it and uh, then we will discuss after I've uh, uh, after I've walked through this uh, this particular. Um, uh, paragraph E here. So uh, looking at eligibility, the, the first uh, way of a student establishing eligibility is, of course, to have a high school diploma or its recognized equivalent. Um, next has obtained a uh, passing score identified by the secretary on an independently administered test in accordance with subpart J of this part. So that's the where we uh, uh, the tests obviously are the approved ATB tests, and the are there are only two mechanisms. Like I, I kind of uh, I, I'm going to apologize. I, 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 I misspoke a little bit uh, before in saying that that the uh, ECCP uh, is the only mechanism through which you can access ATB. That's not quite true. I think it is true for all practical purposes now that we are as far away removed as we are from 2012. Um, in I should say for most practical purposes. So let's take a look at this. They they could take the test and either was, in, was first enrolled in an eligible program before July 1, 2012. So they would have to prove that they were in an eligible program before that. So obviously we could have non-traditional students who meet that uh, meet that requirement or is enrolled in a career pathway program as defined in 668.2, which we just looked at and uh, uh, did our temperature check on. So I think in most cases it is going to be uh, Romanet 2 there, but I do want to point out that there still is this grant, this grandfathering that, that Congress did uh, when they brought back uh, uh, ATB that was probably a little more pertinent at the time. As we as we move away from 2011, um, it, it's less and less so with each year, but certainly it's possible. Um, and three, you can see here we, we bring in the uh, is enrolled in an eligible institution that uh, participates in a state process approved by the secretary under the subpart J of this process, and we'll be looking at the state process uh, later on in this discussion of our ATB issue paper here and either was enrolled uh, in an eligible program before July 1, 2012 or is enrolled in an eligible career pathways program as defined in 668.2. So again, you're seeing there that even with the whether it's through the the uh, the, the, uh, the 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 um, test or the in this case, the state process still have to have the eligible career pathways program. The next mechanism is um, was homeschooled and either obtained a school completion credential for homeschool other than a high school diploma or a recognized equivalent provided by a provider for under state law or if the state does not require homeschool student to obtain a credential described in this section as completed the secondary school education in a home setting that qualifies as an exemption from compulsory attendance requirements under state law. So just that's not pertinent to what we're doing here, but just a reminder of all the ways a student can establish eligibility other than a high school diploma. And lastly, has been determined by the institution to have the ability to benefit from uh, the education or training offered by the institution based on the satisfactory completion of six semester hours, six trimester hours, six quarter hours, or 225 clock hours that are applicable toward a degree of certificate offered by the institution. And that has oh, that has been there uh, for quite some time uh, as we discussed in the history of ATB, but here we are adding uh, for clarification purposes, uh, was either enrolled in a, an eligible program before, two th uh, before July 1, 2012, 
or is enrolled in an eligible career pathway program as defined in 668.2. So basically what we're doing here, I, I think this is a this is a good clarification in the regulations, tying all of these mechanisms that are related to ATB back to the eligible career pathways uh, program requirement. Uh, and again, just throwing in there that there is that other op option, not really an option, it's a possibility where the uh, student was enrolled in an eligible program prior to July 1, 2012. So with that, I'll open it up for comments, discussion. OK, thank you, Greg. If we could stop the screen share, please. Thank you. All right, so uh, questions, comments. Not seeing any. Okay. Um, how about we go ahead and take a temperature check on this section just to just to see where we're at, Greg? I think that's a good idea. Okay. All right. If I could see your thumbs high, please. I'd appreciate it. Jamie, can I? Okay, all thumbs are up. Thank you very much. All right, Greg, you have seven minutes before lunch. I want to thank everyone for that. And um, why don't we move on to just, I'll just, you know, I can describe. I think we're going to move on to uh, 668.156. And here we are, uh, is where we are uh, discussing the approved uh, state process. So I think because this section is a little, uh, um, we're dealing with a little more of a lengthy, uh, a lengthy session here, section here. I would like to, I think I'll go through it by, uh, I'll go through it by applicable paragraph. So why don't I just start with A? We might be able to get a little bit of discussion in. I, I realize we have a, we have a hard stop at 12:30, and we don't have an excessive amount of time for lunch today. So we want to make sure that uh, we adhere to that. Um, so let's just start here. I'll, I'll go through A, we'll have a discussion of that and um, see where we stand. So um, the approved state process, a state that wishes the secretary to consider its state process as an alternative to achieving a passing score on an approved independently administered test or the satisfactory completion of at least six credit hours or recognized equivalent coursework for the purpose of determining um, uh, a student's eligibility uh, for Title IV HEA program funds must first apply to the secretary for approval of that process. So making it clear here that the state that wants to participate in this process must make application to the, uh, the secretary, to the department for approval. And let's look at what the, uh, what the state's application for approval uh, must include. So here that the institutions, uh, it would include the institutions located in the state included in the proposed process, which uh, need not be all of the institutions located in the state, making it clear that the state process does not have to be inclusive of all inst all participating institutions in that state. That the state can, uh, can uh, in this process, can include such institutions as it sees fit or that, that want to be part of this. But in any case, they do have to let, inform the department of which institutions will be participating. The requirements that participating institutions must meet to offer eligible career pathways programs through the state process. So each state has a different process um, and they have different qualifications. Qualifications the institutions are must meet to participate. We need to be informed of what those are. And a certification that as of the date of application, each proposed career pathways program intended for use through the state process Constitutes an constitutes rather an eligible career pathway program that uh, that is uh, described under 668.2, the definition we just went over. So, uh, certifying to us that all of the uh, programs included in this do uh, meet the definition of an eligible career pathways program, and we also uh, are requiring that. Uh, it be disclosed to us what the criteria used for determining student eligibility participation in the state process is. And before um, 
Before approving the state process, the secretary will verify that a sample of the proposed eligible career pathways programs comply with the definition of an eligible career pathways program under 668.2 of this part. So we will be informed of all of the programs that are all the institutions and programs participating uh, in this through the state process. And prior to our approval, we are going to uh, sample some of those um, programs to determine that they do indeed meet the uh, the definition found in 668.2. Uh, so I'll stop there. Uh, we still have we have three minutes. I guess we can entertain a few questions or comments before we reach the 1230 uh, um, break point. OK, uh, Johnson. Yeah, hi, Greg. What, wasn't there a provision that said if the secretary didn't act, act on something within six months, it became. Uh, it was by default approved um, and, and does that does that undercut this monitoring thing where the secretary is supposed to do a sample? The, uh, the when this when the uh, when the school makes applicate when the uh, the uh, the process yeah when the, you're talking about the, the six months um, if 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 the secretary doesn't uh, doesn't act on the uh, on the uh, um, doesn't act on the uh, on the application to uh, either approve or deny. Um, does that does that remain in um, in uh, and and that is that remain in does that remain in effect? And that is in here. Just want to. Um, yeah, I just oh, I was just found it and my colleague just gave it to me here. So if you look at um, D, so it is in this section. We just haven't got to it yet. Um, looking, uh, yeah, D1. OK, so if you look over on D1, uh, that is still included. The secretary uh, responds to the state's request for approval uh, of its state process within six months after the secretary's receipt of that request. If the secretary does not respond by the end of the six months, the state process is deemed to be approved. So uh, that is consistent with what we are uh, um, proposing here because it doesn't require that the secretary have have actually, uh, you know, gone through every step of approval. We simply have to respond uh, to the request for for approval within six months, and that is that is in statute. So we have mirrored that here in our regulation, and uh, again in D in in D one paragraph D one. Okay, thank you, Johnson and Greg, Kelly. Sorry, just trying to find my mute button. Um, question about um, number two and the, the third one where it talks about the a certification um, that each proposed CP or C, sorry, CPP. EC, ECPP. ECPP, ECPP. Um, is part of it. So I guess my question is, does that certification require that each of the pathway programs be listed? Because if not, how are you going to verify a sample in number three if they're not listed? Like, does the state have to list each of the, the programs? Here, I am on mute. OK, I'm not on mute. Uh, so yeah, the, we, this, the uh, the um, um, as you can see in the regulation, the institutions in the state have to be identified, and um, uh, the uh, the and, and through. I mean, we would know. I mean, so obviously, if the institutions are identified, we 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 know um, that those institutions uh, have career pathways programs. I'm not. I don't think. And I'll, I'll ask my colleagues um, who are. Uh, Back monitoring and 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 and, and um, you know doing all this the light work here. I here we we do say the institutions uh, must be identified, and um, we would know obviously then if the institution has been identified that it does have a career pathways program. I think we would have an avenue to to you know to sample that. I don't know that we've been prescriptive here about so when the when the state uh, informs us of the. Um, if the question is when the state informs us of the institutions themselves that would be participating, uh, is it required uh, at that point that the uh, that the um, under the listing of institution that each program be identified or would or would the department uh, 
certainly we could get to, we could get to that by simply querying the schools that we're going to sample or which programs they're offering that are uh, that are career pathways programs. But uh, I'll take that back with me as far as you know. Does that need to be fleshed out um, a, a little bit more? But I think that we I don't think that we're I don't think that we're at a deficit here because if the institutions identified to us, then um, then we know it does have career pathways programs. Uh, the state's certified that it meets, so we can we'll know then which programs those are, um, or we can certainly determine that. But I'll ask for some more clarification here, uh, and I'm being told from my colleagues that yes, we they are going to take that back and think and think about that because we haven't. That's a good question. We um, I think I think that's sort of imputed here, but not not made 100 percent there. Thank you very much. And then Cindy, one, one other question. My um, alternate uh, manual has a question that he would like to ask. Great, thank you. Emmanuel? Thank you so much. Um, I guess this is now more of a comment because of my colleague Kelly, who kind of talked about that issue that she brought up. But I think when we are looking at this, the department should consider, I'm assuming that this would be public available information for students and families to be able to look at and know um what eligible career pathway programs are being offered in the state what institutions are offering them so i'm assuming this is going to be public i just didn't i guess read that it would be but i'm assuming that it would also i think the department should think through across multiple states with varying processes and the components that make up the processes what that would actually be so what i mean is if in one state to have the ability to benefit going through the state process you have to meet certain requirements in mathematics and science and you know education and whatever the case may be but versus another state those requirements are different or they vary does that put that student at a disadvantage if they could you know if they live in texas but they can't seem to go through the state process successfully in texas but in louisiana they could go through that process because the process is different so not that i you know, I'm not advocating for a standardized process necessarily across every single state in the country, but I just think it's something to think through um, when it comes to putting in this language of allowing a state, even though in statute, technically, I guess a state could already do this, um, but just kind of clarifying in the language that there is a six credit hour um, coursework equivalent the state could create. So I just wanted to highlight that and see if the department's gone through that too as well. Okay, thank you. Um, it is, Greg, did you have a response or? No, I, we'll, we'll, thank we'll, you? no we'll take that, we'll take that back. Okay, great. Um, it is 12.34, four minutes past Greg's lunchtime. So uh, with that, we will uh, break for lunch for 30 minutes. We will come back here um, around 12 o'clock. Um, you are free to log off and sign back in, or you can mute yourself and go off camera. It is entirely up to you. With that, let's go off live broadcast and everyone have a great lunch. Thanks.